couple of things here. So we are on the 16th right now, right here. So with this group, we have three days until the day before the next exam. Remember, we're having too many exams. So exam four is really two parts. So we have two 50-point exams that will combine to make your exam four. Uh, that exam is just going to be, well, be in chapter seven and eight. We're going to begin with chapter eight today. And then as we're going along, I know that we didn't cover chapter seven in class, but I want you to be, you know, doing the notes offline and practice those questions. We'll have a quiz on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. That will be chapter seven and the part of chapter eight we're going to cover today. You'll find that chapter seven is really just kinematic. You could have already covered it, and you could have already seen chapter seven if you haven't yet. But if you haven't, then please uh, review that. And I want some time on these good questions about it. Um, so we'll have a quiz on Wednesday, and then we'll have another quiz before the next exam. That'll give us seven, seven quizzes. That means I'll drop your row of three, so you'll count those top four quizzes. Okay? Uh, also, the grades. I posted all the grades online. I haven't updated the class participation, but if you want that updated guide, you have to go send me an email. It's almost all of you, almost all of you have 50 points. So uh, if you had that last time, just make sure that you still have that now. Um, I also posted how to make an A, make a B, C, or D. Those are the grades that you need on exam four, the two combined mini exams, and the final in order to get an A, B, C, or D. So if you have an 80%, you need an 80% to get an A, you need an 80% on exam four, on both of them, and an 80% on the final. The final is 150 points, so it's 80% of 150, which I think is what 120 is. Okay? Uh, those are a little bit of an overestimate of what you need, especially if you do really well on the next two quizzes. That means your quiz average is going to go up from what it is now, and if you get more extra credit. Remember, even if you can't attend the help sessions, you can always watch them online and then send me a photo of those notes. Uh, you can't go back and redo them now, but we'll have a help session next week, we'll have one the next week and the next week. And maybe the next week, we'll probably have three or four more health sessions for about six to eight or ten points that you can still pick up in the class. Uh, just make sure you send me those notes. You can still send me notes for this most recent health session. Those will be due on Monday at five. I know that's kind of far away. Most of you have already sent them to me, but technically the due date is Monday at five, so you can still send them. Any questions? Are people just skipping class? They're just saying this is fall break and we're going to push right on ahead? Are any of your faculty canceling class? No? Okay, good. I've heard rumors that that might be the case. But it's just other departments, I think. All right. Um, let's jump into Chapter 8 then. There are two things I want to talk about in Chapter 8 that I want you to master by the end of today. And these two things will be on the quiz come. Wednesday, and that is how to calculate torque, how to calculate net torque, and how to determine the moment of inertia, and what is moment of inertia. So you need to review those questions as you get ready for the quiz on Wednesday. Also, don't forget chapter seven will be on that quiz, and uh, I'll answer questions about that come next Wednesday. So first of all, torque. When I talk about torque, torque is equal to A force times a moment arm times the angle between them. So I give you a figure here where this is my axis of rotation. This distance is the moment arm. Um, and that is just the, the distance from where the force is applied to the axis of rotation. And then this is my force. So this is R, that's my moment arm. Uh, the force is F. And then you multiply the product of those, you take the product of those and multiply that times the sine of theta. And that's how I calculate the torque. This comes about, in case you're interested, you don't need to know this, but this comes about from a tool in vector calculus that's called a cross product. Torque is equal to the cross product of R and F. And this is the result of that, that torque is equal to F R sine theta. Uh, calculus has some really useful tools for dealing with vectors, and the cross product is one of them. We've already seen another one, and that was that the work is equal to the dot product 
of F and D, a force and displacement? Again, ERA needs no so this, if you're interested, if you like calculus, if you've seen vector calculus, that's usually calc three, uh, it's, it's comes up there. So what the dot product does is it takes two vectors and puts them in the same direction. Remember with force and displacement, a, work that, a force doesn't do work if the two are perpendicular. And so what it did is it took a component of the force in the same direction as the displacement. And that's what the dot product does. The cross product does something similar. Where it takes a force and it takes the component of the vector that's perpendicular to that force. And so a force will not do torque if it's not perpendicular. If you have a parallel force, then there's no torque being acted upon on that, on that object. And that's where that sine theta term comes from. Anyway, that's our expression for torque, F R sine theta. And often we'll have the angle for theta to be 90 degrees. We did this in the lab. If you've had the torques lab yet, where you did the meter stick with the masses on it, trying to balance it. In that lab, the angle is always 90 degrees. And when that's the case, the torque is just equal to F times R, because as you know, the sine of 90 degrees is equal to one. All right. Um, let's try this question. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Let's go back. There's one other thing I want you to show you, and that is that when we're talking about torques, that a clockwise torque is negative and a counterclockwise torque is positive. So say, for example, I have a board. It's rotating about this axis. If I apply a force to it in this direction, I want to ask myself the question is, does that force cause a clockwise or counterclockwise motion? Does that force acting on this object, which rotates about this axis, cause this to move in the clockwise direction or the counterclockwise direction? Counterclockwise, right? It makes it move like this. That's counterclockwise, so that would be a positive torque. Whereas if I had an object, it rotated about this axis, and the force was in this direction, that would cause a clockwise torque or a negative torque. That's just a notation that we use. Clockwise is negative, counterclockwise is positive. So with that in mind, let's try the next question, where I calculate the net torque on this object. This object is rotating about an axis C. So it's rotating about that axis. So I want to ask myself the question, first of all, which forces are force, force or forces, do no torque at all? Because they don't, is there any torque on this system? And then I can just get rid of those forces. And then of the remaining forces, do they do a positive or negative torque? And then you just take the sum of those to find the net torque. You add up those values. Which force or forces do no force at all? None. Which force? Which force doesn't do any force at all? The middle one, right? The middle one doesn't do any torque because that force is acting at the axis of rotation. So R is equal to zero for that force. And then you have to ask which of the do those forces? 25 and 20 newtons, do they do positive or negative torque on that system? Clockwise, negative, 
are counterclockwise positive. I'm going to try to wrap this up in about 10 seconds. I'll stop at uh, 3.10. All right. So on this, first of all, this force does no torque at all. There's no torque because R is equal to zero. There's another way that a force can do no torque. It can be R equals zero, or what's the other option for a force, or the other possibility for a force that does no torque? What would it be? I gotta think about the door. A couple of ways I can think about this. But if I push on this door, the axis of rotation is right here. If I push right here, I don't apply any force to that door, right? It's just very difficult to open it because I'm not providing any force. Another way where I can't get any force is if I push on the door in this direction. So if I push on this direction, where the angle between the force and the moment drawing is equal to zero degrees. If the angle is zero degrees, then that means that the, uh, the torque is also zero. So for example, if I had a force that was right here, that torque would also be zero. But I have two other forces here. I have uh, the 25 Newton force. Is that force going to cause a positive or negative torque? Is it going to cause a counterclockwise or clockwise torque? Uh, the 25 Newton is counterclockwise. You can think of this force. It has two components, one in this direction and one in this direction. And this component of that does a positive torque, a clockwise torque. And then likewise, over here, I have two components there. That component doesn't do any torque. But what about this one? Does it have clockwise or counterclockwise torque? It has clockwise. It makes that object move in the clockwise direction or a negative torque. So if I call this torque 1 and this torque 2, my answer for the sum of the torques would be torque 1 minus torque 2 would equal to what that's going to be my answer. So torque 1 would be 25 times 2 meters times the sine of 45. Minus torque 2 is going to be uh, 20 newtons times 2 meters. That's this distance right here times sine of 20 degrees, and then that gives me positive 22 newton meters. And because it's positive, it's going to be counterclockwise. So C is the right answer there. All right, that's going to come up several times on the exam, and I'm going to come up on Wednesday's quiz for you. Just, I'll give you a scenario like this, and I'll ask you to calculate what is the next force. We'll do another example like that in just a second. Well, let's try to do an equilibrium problem. This is just like what you've been doing in lab. In lab, when you have the torques problem, say if I have a system that is balanced, say I have a, I don't know, a four Newton force over here. And if this distance is six meters and I have a, um, a 12 Newton force over here, what must this distance be in order for that to be balanced. But what you would say is you would say that the torques on one side, or rather that the sum of all the torques has to equal zero. And so if I have uh, this force 
is causing the object to move what's that counterclockwise. So this force causes a positive torque, and this torque causes a negative torque. And I can add those up, and they have to equal to zero if I'm to have an equilibrium position. Now in the lab equilibrium uh, situation, in the lab we did this a little more simply. We just said that the torque on this side is equal to the torque on this side. But I urge you to think more deeply about the direction of the torque, because it will become relevant in other situations. Okay, so go ahead and start doing that now. Um, so I would I'll call this torque one, this torque two. Torque one minus torque two equals to zero. Uh, 12 times the distance x minus 6 times the distance 4 is equal to 0, and so x is equal to 2. All right, this is a similar question. I want you to try this one. Guy on a 5 meter long board, 4 meters from the pivot, has a mass of 75 kilograms, so a, a weight of 750 newtons. Uh, where can Kaiser stand? so that it balances this system. Kind of Kaiser's my wife. I, this is, my name's Chad, and her name, that's me and her. This sort of looks like me. All right, where can she stand to balance this seesaw type thing? Right, let's try to wrap up in about 10 or 15 seconds. I'll stop at 1.15, 1 1.15. 1 All right, I'll already put A. And let's see, if I put A, so I have uh, 750 newtons over here. And what you're saying is if I put a 600 Newton force over here, that that will balance the system. But if I put a 600 Newton force, the torque that I have on this side is 600 uh, Newton meters, 600 times one. Whereas over here, if I put 750 Newton Newtons at four meters, that's gonna be 3000 Newton meters. So even if I put Kaiser at the far end of this seesaw, it's still not going to balance the system. So the answer is not A, it's going to be B, that she cannot balance the board. In fact, where would you have to put her in order to balance the system? Let's see, let's make sure I get my signs right. This is a, on the left, is going to be a counterclockwise, so that's a positive torque. This would be a negative torque. So I'll call this torque one and torque two. Torque one minus torque two must equal to zero. That's for equilibrium, that the sum of the torques must equal to zero. Uh, 600 newtons times x minus 750 newtons times four equals to zero. So that means that x has to equal to 3,000 divided by 600 are five meters. So she has to be actually a whole distance of five meters, so out here somewhere in order to balance the seesaw. You've been on a seesaw before, right? Like with a little kid? If you have a little kid on the end of a seesaw, you don't sit all the way at the end, right? You have to seat sort of halfway on the seesaw so that you can do the seesaw, you know, the way that a seesaw is supposed to be done. Think about that. Uh, a lot of these questions you don't want to think about. A lot of questions you'll have to actually work out. Let's try some practice questions back in the back of the book.
All right, this is exam three, fall 16. Exam three, fall 16. Let's do number 25 right now. So just like you did before, ask yourself which, if any, forces don't do any torque at all, and you should get rid of those. Remember, there are two, two reasons why a force can not do a torque. Either it acts at the axis of rotation, or it, uh, it acts at an angle of zero degrees. And then ask yourself, are the remaining forces do counterclockwise or clockwise force? And then add up the remaining force. Let's do the sum of those. Let's try to wrap this up in about 15 seconds, up at 2.15. If you finish this one, you can go on and do the next one. That's number uh, 26, if you like. Right now we're on 25. Stop it at 2.15. Okay, looks like I got this pretty well. So first thing I ask, which force doesn't do any torque? Which one is that? The what now? Yeah, the one at C, right. So this one, this force doesn't do any torque because it's acting at the axis of rotation. Um, and then I want to ask, which of these remaining do positive or negative force? So the 20 Newton force causes the, the bar to rotate in this direction. It pulls up on it, and that's a clockwise or counterclockwise? That's a clockwise torque. So I'll call that torque 1, and it's going to be negative. So I have a negative torque one. And then this other force, does it do clockwise or counterclockwise? Remember, there are two components to this force, one here and one here. The parallel one doesn't do any torque at all. The perpendicular one, clockwise or counterclockwise? <coughs> counterclockwise. So I'm just going to be a positive torque two. Then if I want to know the net torque, I say negative torque one plus torque two is equal to, I'm sorry, not equal to zero, is equal to uh, 20 times 1. I can write sine of 90, but I know that's equal to 1, so I'm just going to leave that out. That's negative plus 10 times 3. The 3 comes from this distance, which I know is 4 minus 1 meters, or 3 meters, times the sine of 30. And so that's equal to um, five, negative 5 newton meters, which is clockwise 5 newton meters. OK? Seems like I got that OK, right? Hey, listen, two cats on a roof. Which one is going to fly off? The one with the smaller meat. Did I get it? Uh, <coughs> the smaller meat, the smaller total thickness. It will fly off more quickly. 
他就下来，听到，他就到太阳了。All right. Uh, let's turn number twenty-six. Where do you place the two kilogram mass to have a rotational equilibrium? All right, let's stop at uh, 105, 105. Just not sure. Okay, good. C is the right answer. Um, this is like, you know, the parent taking their kid on the seesaw that you have to be right here in order to balance that smaller mass. I have a 20 Newton force here. That's 2 kilograms times 10. And I have a 10 Newton force acting over here. That 1 kilogram mass provides a 10 Newton force. So uh, this is a positive torque. This is a negative torque. Let's say 20 times x minus 10 times 2 is equal to uh, 0. And then I solve that for x. x has to be 1 meter. So the answer is C, to have 1 meter. All right, let's look at moments of inertia now. Um, so let's go back into the chapter. There's still some things that I want you to go back and look at in the in the screencast, so make sure you go back and review those for chapter eight and for chapter seven too, if you haven't yet. Um, so far, we've made these translations as we move from a linear framework where we have things moving in a straight line to things rotating in a circle. So so far, we've made these changes. We where we've had x before, we've substituted for theta, and where we've had v before. We're now substituting omega. That's the angular velocity. Where we had a, we're now substituting alpha. Where we had uh, force, now we're using torques. So a torque is sort of like the equivalent of a force in that it produces this rotational motion or rotational acceleration. We'll see that next time we come together. And then before we dealt with mass. So remember mass was a measure of inertia. We said that it was a, a basic property of any material, that all properties have a mass and they have a charge. Uh, and so it's just a basic property of matter. And inertia is a measure of that mass. Inertia further describes how easily it is to set an object into motion. If an object doesn't have much inertia, it's easier to set it into motion. If it has a lot of inertia, it has a lot of mass, then it requires a big force to set it into motion. And so here we're going to use something called the moment of inertia, where m, where we had m, we're now going to have i, and that's called the moment of inertia, or i. Listen, I can rotate my body. It's pretty easy for me to rotate about this axis, right? That was easy, correct? But is it easy for me to rotate about this axis? No, but my inertia is the same because the mass, I haven't changed my mass in any way. But when I think about rotating about this axis, you want to see me rotating about this axis? Okay, yeah. uh, but it's a lot harder to rotate about this axis because my mass is now distributed in a different way. But here, when I'm rotating about this axis, all my mass is really close to the axis of rotation. Really close, so this distance is just small. But if I'm rotating about this axis, I have mass at a distance that's much further from the axis of rotation. So the moment of inertia.
inertia considers not just the mass of the object, but also the distance of that mass from the axis of rotation. There are going to be two things that you'll need to think about, and that is uh, for a discrete set of particles, and then also for rigid objects. Let's do the discrete particles. First of all, our moment of inertia is equal to the sum of m r squared, where m is the mass and r is the distance to the axis of rotation. When we're dealing with a discrete set of particles, like in this, this little example right here, I just use that. I say that the moment of inertia for this discrete set of particles is I have a three kilogram mass times the distance, which is one meter squared plus a one kilogram times two meters squared plus two kilograms times three meters squared. So that's three plus four plus 18 is equal to 25, and the units for that are going to be kilogram meter squared. I want you to recognize here that this big mass, this is the biggest mass of all three, that it contributes the least to the moment of inertia. That's because the distance of this mass from the axis of rotation, this is my axis of rotation, this whole thing is swinging around like this, that this mass is really close to the axis of rotation. And when the mass is close to the axis of rotation, it's really easy to spin it. But as I put masses out at bigger radii, it becomes a lot more difficult to, uh, to change the motion of that object because its moment of inertia increases. And so this mass had a much bigger moment of inertia than this one, even though it was a smaller mass. It was just three times as far as Okay? Moment of inertia is heavily dependent upon the distance to the axis of rotation. It's a quadratic function. So if I double r, that quadruples i times m r squared. If I double r, it quadruples r. If I triple it, it's just multiplied by 9. Heavily dependent upon the, the distance to the axis of rotation. That's one thing that you'll have to do, is to determine the moment of inertia for a discrete set of particles. And then you'll also have to figure out what is the moment of inertia for our rigid bodies. We do this in the calculus-based physics where we take bodies like this and we figure out what is the moment of inertia. We have to derive these equations. So these equations are all taken by integrating over the volume of an object. And there are methods that you learn how to do that in calculus 2 and 3 to integrate over a body. It's not cool. I just like one of my favorite classes. Because you're, you're actually pulling a picture of these things in a mathematical sense. But I'm just going to give you the equations for this class. You need to know how to use them. These are just different shapes, like a hoop or a wheel. This would be like a hula hoop that rotates about its central axis. I want you to notice that all of them have particular shapes, and then also they have particular axes. Like this cylinder, if I'm rotating about this axis, that's sort of like me doing this. Rotating about this axis, then the moment of inertia is that. But if I'm rotating about this axis, that would be like doing a forward flip, then the moment of inertia is a lot different. And in fact, it turns out to be a lot bigger if I'm rotating around an axis through the center. Also here, I have two different spheres. I have a solid sphere, and I have a thin-walled hollow sphere. If I have these two spheres, and let's say that they were the same mass, but the solid sphere is solid and the pinball sphere is thin. Oh, which would have the bigger moment of inertia? If they both have the same mass and dimension, the solid or the hollow sphere would have a bigger moment of inertia. The hollow sphere is right. Because with the hollow sphere, the mass is out at large radii. Whereas with the, the solid sphere, you have mass at small radii and then all the way to that. So the hollow sphere has quite a much bigger um, moments of inertia, and you can see that by these coefficients, that two-thirds is bigger than two-fifths. Now, when you encounter problems, oh, let's see. Okay, yeah, so let's try this quick test, and then we'll go to the back and look, and we'll try some with rigid bodies. Let's try this one, though. This is just a discrete set of particles, each with a mass of one kilogram, 
And I want to know what is the moment of inertia for this configuration of particles? All right, let's um, wrap up in about 10 seconds. All right, let's stop at 1.48. Okay, good. B is the right answer. Uh, if you made a mistake, you probably didn't get R right. So recognize here that I have one kilogram masses, and then the distance here is one meter. That means that this distance is a half a meter. So my moment of inertia is going to be mR squared, uh, which is going to be one kilogram times one half of a meter squared, but then there are four of those particles, and they're all identical, so I'm just going to multiply this times four. So that's four times a quarter, which is one kilogram meter squared. I will say that when you have these multiple particles, that they all add up. And then likewise, we'll see this a little later, that if I have multiple rigid bodies that are rotating, they'll add up too. Like Let's say, for example, that I have a cylinder or a disc. By the way, whenever I say disc, you want to think cylinder. You might want to write that something you want to to that table. That a disc is the same as a cylinder. A disc is really just a flat thing. Uh, but let's say that I have a disc like this, and then I plop a sphere on top of it. See, it's rotating around that axis. And I put a sphere on top of it. Then I can calculate what is the total moment of inertia. It's going to be 1 half mR squared plus the moment of inertia of a sphere are two-fifths mR squared. So if I have two rigid bodies and I bring them together, I can find their total moment of inertia just by adding up their individual moments of inertia. Just like if I had two objects with mass come together, I would just add their masses. So you treat moments of inertia very much like you would mass. We'll see that come up next time when we do energy and momentum in Newton's second law. Alright, let's go back into the old exams. I'm going to do a couple of questions before you all go. Let's look at exam four on fall 16. And I want to do, let's do question three first and then we'll do question four. Number three here. I have this uh, flat piece of metal. And these dots show the axes of rotation. So for example here, if this is my axis of rotation, this whole thing rotates around point K. And I want you to rank the moments of, of inertia from largest to smallest.
Anytime you see a ranking question, which ranking questions come up a lot in standardized tests, um, you want to look at your options. So ask yourself first is what is the biggest, what is the biggest moment of inertia? And then you can go through the options and pick out the ones that, that don't count. So for example, here, the biggest is either IA, IB, or IC. Ask yourself which of those is the biggest of the moments of inertia. And then you can get rid of a lot of different options. All right, let's stop at say 148, 148. All right, which do you think is the biggest moment of inertia? About which point? That is, when I ask that question, I'm really asking, which point has more mass at a bigger distance from its axis of rotation than any other point? Which would that be? Point A. All right, so point A has the biggest moment of inertia. Because point A, I have all of this mass at a really far distance. And that's not true for any of the other points. So if I, if I know that point A is the biggest, then I can get rid of all these other options. And then I ask, what is the smallest? Well, it better be C, right? Because that's all that I have here is C. And it turns out that C, being in the center of this object, puts more of the mass at smaller distances from the axis of rotation. In fact, this is the smallest moment of inertia you can get for this. So now let's look at B and D. Uh, in option C, it says that the moment of inertia C is bigger than D. And here it says that they're equal. Well, which is it? Is D bigger than D, or are they equal on that? Are they the same, D and D? They are. They're symmetrical to one another. So the answer has to be E, that IA is bigger than B, which is equal to D, which is bigger than C. So E is the right answer there. You'll see different types of questions like that. You'll almost certainly see a question like that on the exam. I, I'll often put those on the exam, so look at those. Uh, now let's do number four. So this is where I have two objects that are coming together. I have a rotating disk, and then I have another object, a particle or a mass, that hops onto the outer edge of this disk. And I want to know now what is the total moment of inertia for this system. There are these two objects that have come together. All right, let's wrap up in about 10 seconds. We'll stop at 145. All right, so we're sort of all over the board. The hard part about this is figuring out what to do about that particle. Like what kind of object do you treat this at? How do you calculate the moment of inertia for this object? I think this the disk, we know, right? We know what, how to calculate the moment of the disk. What is it equal to? It's one half mr squared. It's the same as a cylinder. So the moment of inertia for the disk is one half mr squared. You can find that on that equation sheet that I give you. I'll give you that table with all the rigid bodies on. But what type of body is this? How do we treat this object? You might be inclined to think that it's a sphere, right? Because it sort of looks like a circle. But the sphere. They rotate about this axis, or uh, they were either and they were either solid or hollow. And this is either one of them. Like it doesn't rotate about that axis through the center. 
we're going to treat this object just as a particle. So it's a discrete particle that's rotating about a distance from the axis of rotation. And so the moment of inertia of this object is just going to be mr squared. So my moment of inertia would be 1 half mr squared plus mr squared. Be careful, those m's and r's are different. Uh, so that's going to be 1 half of the disk mass, which is 3 kilograms, times its radius, which is 2 meters squared, plus 4 kilograms times 2 meters squared. So that's a half of that's 6 plus 16 or 22. So B is the right answer, 22 kilogram meters squared. By the way, it could happen too that you do have two rigid bodies, like a a disc and a bar or a rod or a disc and a sphere. And we'll see that next time when we get into momentum and energy and Newton's second law. In fact, in chapter 8, we'll see everything that we've done to this point will lead into the recap because everything's going to come back as we look at those things again. Uh, not in the same depth, but you'll definitely see all of these things come back again. Okay? Quiz on Wednesday. That's chapter 7. And then these two things that we looked at. The, uh, the torque and the moment of inertia. They theoretically are the same right there. We'll have time at the beginning of class if you have questions. Alrighty? Have a good day. No help question today.